opportunity to come into your home, Lord. We thank this opportunity that we may come upstairs and meet with you, Lord. And Lord, I ask that you have a message for every single one of us here, Lord. I know that these are stories that you've written in the Old Testament, Lord, but don't let us get, you know, satisfied with just learning the story, Lord. But we know that there's principles and concepts here, Lord. The way that you work that still exist today, Lord, and the way, way that you pursue us, that you, that you transform us, Lord. So I ask that, uh, that you open our eyes to that, you open our hearts to that, Lord. I ask that you give me the gift of prophecy that I may deliver your word to your people, Lord, and that we all leave here today edified. And we ask in session of our saints and our tears, as we pray th thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for us the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, I'm going to take a shot in the dark. Do you need a second to adjust audio? Because I could tell that it was a little... You think we're okay? Okay, cool. It's more on the, on the video part because sometimes it's not like picking up. But... Yeah, can you guys... Everyone can hear okay, right? All right, cool. We're fine. All right. So, um, does anyone remember what series we're in right now? <clears throat> Great, because it's not really a series. It's basically Peter talking about whatever Peter wants to talk about. And I have not committed to another series. And I've been buying myself one week at a time. But honestly, I think with uh, the changing of the month, maybe this will be the last week where I do whatever I want to do. And we will start a series next week, which is undisclosed because I haven't decided what it's going to be yet. So we're going to share one of my, uh, I don't want to say favorite Bible stories, but it's, it's, it's something that happened in the Bible that I always look back upon very, very fondly. And I love it because it's the story of like God kind of doing the unpredictable. And one of the things that you see in the scriptures is like God will take something, he'll turn it into something completely different that you never could have foresaw. And um, it has to do about a, a character that I really, really uh, love and enjoy as well. But before we jump into that, I want to kind of lay a little bit of foundation because I want to say like, what is, what is our expectation when we show up to church every week, right? Like, like what do we come to do? Because I will tell you the one thing, and I almost want to tell you it's like God's worst nightmare, even though that's extreme. But I will tell you the one thing that God does not want you to do is just come up here, show up, worship, and leave. Right? Like, like that's, that's like the beginning of God's plan for you, but he would never, ever intend just to leave you that way. Because... Really, if you look at the pages of scriptures and the promises, like God's plan for us is to conform to his image, right? And so really, like the word that I want to use for that today is like to, to transform us, right? From glory to glory, right? Like his whole thing is it's like he wants to take us a certain way and he wants to turn us into something completely different and completely better. And one of the things that I love, especially in the Old Testament, is you see stories of transformation like left and right. Um, because our God is the author of great transformation stories. And one of the ones that I really love to go back and to kind of read is in 1 Samuel, right? Does any, can anyone tell me whose story is in 1 Samuel? What was that, Reagan? <laughs> that's, that's, that's like the low-hanging fruit answer, which is Samuel, but it's actually not Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel 16. But there's a big Bible character that's, that's covered in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. King David, yes, yes, King David, okay? Um, but before we jump into King David and like what God did with him, I kind of want to share one of like my favorite things about like that, that book, right? And at this point of time, who was, who was the king before David? Saul, right? Did Saul start well? Started very well, right? Did he end well? No, like crash and burned, okay? Um, he was the first king of Israel, and uh, he, had, in the, he started out having a heart for the Lord. Um, after that, pride kind of crept in. He started doing things that were like very, very disappointing. Um, he not only disappointed God, but he disappointed Samuel because Samuel was the prophet at that time that kind of like he found him, he ordained him, he mentored him. He did all of these things, right? Um, and then it got to the point where the wheels kind of fell off the car for Samuel. I mean, not Samuel, uh, forgive me, for Saul. Right? And that was a really hard time for Samuel because that was, that was kind of like his son, right? Like he saw, like he, he kind of like brought him up in all of that. And uh, in Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, 
seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel, right? So before we jump into David, I just want to point out something, right? See, because at this point, Samuel was stuck, right? Like he was stuck. He had all of his eggs in that basket with Samuel. I'm sorry, with, with Saul. And he had invested in Saul. He had worked with Saul. He had tried to get Saul like on the right track. He was doing all of this stuff. And he just got stuck. And there's a lot of times in our life where we also get stuck, okay? Because we had something that we had real big hopes for, real big dreams for. We were really thinking that this was where God was going to work. And it turns out that it just, it didn't. It didn't. And, and we get stuck, right? A lot of the times it's so much like, you know, in this situation, Samuel was disappointed over Saul and got stuck in that, right? In our lives, a lot of the times we get disappointed, not in other people's mistakes, but like in our own mistakes. And we get stuck. Right? And we sit there and we think, well, well, now what? Right? Like we get so stuck on our own disappointments and failures that we don't like, just like Samuel in this story, like he just, he was stuck. You know, um, and there's this beautiful part, right, where, you know, so he's already telling him, like, like I said, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him over Israel? And then he says, fill your horn with oil and go. Right? And there's this thing here where it's like, you know, God already knew what was next, okay? For Samuel, he got stuck at the failure of, of Saul, right? But the problem is, is he was sitting in that. And God was telling him, hey, man, like, you got, you got to get up, right? Like, I've got a plan here. You got to fill your, ho whole, uh, your horn with oil, right? Which was back then a sign of, like, the Holy Spirit. It was a sign of joy, right? And he's basically telling him that, like, I have this whole other plan. I've got this whole other part B that I need you to catch up on, okay? Because I'm not going to sit here stuck with you. Like, I'm ready to, like, move, move over, right? And there's a, a lot of the times where we get, we hear all of the voices in our head, right? Like, we're stuck, and, and there's voices in our head basically saying, hey, like, you can't do this, right? Or who are you? Or this is never going to get better. Or this is the end of the road. Like, now you're desperate. Like, that's, that's it. Like, give up right? But I am telling you that, like, don't miss your moment. Like, for, for Samuel here, like, there, there was more to come. And what God was saying is, like, dude, don't miss your moment, right? Because afterwards, he said, for I'm sending you to Jesse, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And I think that is such an encouraging thought, right? Where Samuel was hopeless, and he thought that it was broken, and he thought that, like, you know, well, now what? And he sat there looking at Saul and just was miserable over him, right? God's telling him, like, you need to move forward. Like, forget the things of the past. Like, I have a plan, and when you're ready to move, I can implement that plan. But right now, I'm waiting on you because he insisted on being stuck, and he says, I want you to catch up. So Samuel goes to Jesse's house, right? And Jesse has seven sons, and one more that is out, right? So he basically, after all seven sons have passed by in verse 10, Jesse made seven sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these, right? So he basically knows what he's there for, right? And he said, I need you to bring out all your kids. He passes them by one, by one, by one. <laughs> and Samuel's like, nope, nope, nope. And Samuel says to Jesse, are all the young men here? And he says, well, there remains the youngest, you know, and, and, and he's out there. He's basically just keeping with the sheep. And I want you guys to understand, like, um, imagine what that means. Like, he knows that he's there to see all of his sons, right? He knows that something like God has clearly spoken about one of his kids, and he only brings out seven, and he completely overlooks David. And what that means is even his own father, right? Like, even his own father didn't even consider him an option. Like, wrap your mind around that, right? Was not even taken into consideration by his own father when the, the prophet, the man of God, comes to him and says, show me all your kids. 
See, no way this kid would be able to be king in the palace, right? Like, you wouldn't want that guy. Like, he's not qualified. He tends sheep, right? He, like, that's all he, he, he only tends sheep. Like, these other ones, they're warriors. Like, they fit the mold, right? That, that's what you're kind of looking for, but not that he just tends sheep. And to be honest, whenever he comes in from outside, he smells. He smells up the place, right? Like, because that's all he does. He spends all his time with the sheep. And I love what Samuel says. He says, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. Think about the power of that statement. Like, not only go send him, but I'm, I'm not even going to sit down. Like, I will stand here waiting for him. And I'm going to thank you, I'm going to tell you guys that I'm very thankful for a God that will send for you, that will use you, that will call you when no one else thinks you're worthy, when no one else thinks that you can do it, right? He'll send for you when everyone else has forgotten you. You may stink, you may have your issues, you may have made your own mistakes, right? Um, but not only will he send for you, but he said, I won't sit down until you get here. So let me ask you, do you, do you think that David smelled? 100%, 100%, right? And the thing is, is like, did he have his issues? 100%, right? Like, I'll be honest with you, I don't want to be too hard on, on Jesse because there were probably very legitimate reasons why he thought there's no way it could be David. But the, real, the reality of it is, is when God calls, right, he's got grace for that. And I think that's a beautiful promise for every single one of us here. Because it's not the fact that we don't have issues. It's not the fact that we are not worthy. It's not the fact that, like, you know, we might have even disqualified ourselves from the call. But God will look at all of that and he'll be like, I have a grace for that. If you come here smelly, dirty, everything else, like, I have a grace for that. Right? Because God will call us when we're smelly, dirty, and broken, and, and unqualified. But the reality of it is, is he doesn't plan on leaving us that way. Because he transforms us in the process. Right? So I love a God who will send us even when we smell like sheep. And then in verse 12, it says, So he sent and he brought him in. Now he was ruddy, with bright eyes, good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. And I'm going to tell you that there are certain things in our life, like I know, like we all know, that for King David, this was one of those moments in his life that changed everything, right? Changed everything. And I'm going to tell you that there's moments in our life, interactions that we've had with God that, that should have changed everything for us, right? And we just, we take hold of it and we run, right? And this was King David's moment, right? It happened in front of his dad. It happened in front of his brothers. It was undeniable. Right? And he held on to that moment, and you'll see that it didn't come to fruition right away, but he held on to that, that moment, and he ran with it. Right? He tucked it so deep inside of his heart that it forever changed him. And I'm asking you, is have you had that moment where you know, it was so real to you that with that's, that's what we hold on to? And we know that the, no matter the hardship, no matter what we're going through, no matter what the temptation, no matter what's on the other side of it, you know, all of these things that we just hold on to it, because not all moments are created equal, right? And I believe that God gives us moments and in our obedience to be able to hold on to that moment and to preserve that moment and to tuck it deep inside the same way that David did, that will forever change the momentum of your life. Because your obedience and your faith will determine whether it's just a moment, right? Because it could have just been a moment and gone right away. Or it could have been the moment that started the transformation for the rest of your life. And that's what you have to kind of decide. So... Then it says, so Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Imagine what that was like. The forgotten son, the least of all of his brethren, the one who they gave the most meaningless tasks to, anointed in front of all of his brothers, right? And all of the brothers, I'm sure, when they were walking in front of Samuel, they were just saying, hey, is it me? Is it me? Could it be me? Right? It wasn't any of them. All they got to do was just watch their baby brother be anointed. Imagine the envy, right? Imagine, 
you know, that they appear to be the better candidate. You know, they're probably looking at this kid and be like, that kid, I'm way more qualified for this. Like, it should be me, right? And, and I'll tell you, this is one of those great things you remember that was like, you know, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble, right? And the thing is, is you see it perfectly here, right? He resisted the proud brothers, right? And then and we see that it's not shown up in that part of the story, but we see the brothers, the brothers were kind of a little bit arrogant, right? A little bit judgmental. But David, just meek and humble. And you can tell that because what does David do next, right? At this point, he's anointed king. Does he pack a bag? Does he say, hey, point me towards the, the palace? You know, where, where's my right way to go? Like, where's my room going to be? Like, I need to get out of here. No, it says that he went right back to tending sheep. Imagine that. Imagine that, right? Like, just anointed king by Samuel, and he goes right back to tending sheep. And I will tell you, it's the moments in life that seem insignificant that prepares for the moments that are the most significant. So the problem is that his job seemed insignificant. He was just out there tending sheep. But was it? No, not at all. That was God's training ground for huge opportunities come forward. He learned a lot as a shepherd. But it seemed ins insignificant, but it never was, right? And I think the, the thing that hit me is how much stuff do we do in our life that seems so insignificant? It seems like we're just doing the same thing maybe day after day, you know, whether you're a student, whether, you know, you've got a regular job, whether you're a mom, you know, and you think that all the stuff that you're doing is not worth a whole lot. You're kind of, it's just the, the, the daily grind, right? You haven't even a, accomplished anything important. But the problem is, is like, you know, that's our view of it, but what God's looking at is he's looking at our faithfulness and he uses it. He uses it to develop us. He uses us to build us. He uses us to prepare us right? Because for David, he had two jobs, right? One of them was tending sheep, and the second one was playing the harp for, Paul, uh, for Saul. So David is doing his job, just living his life, um, <coughs> which is usually when we get in trouble, but he's back in his daily routine and just, you know, just doing what he did before. But don't ever underestimate someone because of the fact that you know, he was the youngest one, he didn't have an important job, he didn't this, he didn't have any of that stuff, right? Because he was exactly where God needed him to be at the time where he was training to prepare him for what God needed him to do. And that goes for every single one of us here as well. And I always wonder when God looks at us, right, individually, right, what do you think he sees? You know, I promise you when God, when God looks at Peter, right, like when he's looking at me, I promise you he, he sees you know, where I started, you know, like what I was like before. He, he, sees, he sees the man I am right now with all of my flaws, right? But then I also promise he also sees the finished product, like after transformation, because God's outside of time. So he sees us in every single stage, right? So the question is, is what do you think God looks at, like, when he looks at you? What do you think he sees? Do you think he, he sees you right now and he says, all right, cool, we're good there? Or does he see you and all of that potential inside of you and sees what's on the other side of it once you actually live all of that out, right? And I will tell you that God has so much plan and so much opportunity for every single one of us, right? But the only way for us to know what that is is to walk in obedience so that God can call all of that out of us, right? So later in the story, the three oldest sons of Jesse, they go to follow, to follow Saul into battle, right? And it says that the name of the three sons who were in the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and Abadad and uh, Shema. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his brother's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine grew near and presented himself for 40 days, mornings, and evenings. So the thing is, is I want you guys, a lot of the times we don't realize, like we all know that you know, David defeated Goliath, but you got to set the stage for what this battle looked like. Okay, So you had you know, the Israelites on one side, you have the Philistines on the other side, and every day, Goliath would come out and he would just taunt them. Every morning and every night, he would just taunt them. And he would say, like, look, guys, you know, w send someone to fight me, okay? And if I win, you guys all become my slaves, and if you guys win, we will all become your slaves, okay? Every day for 40 days, 40 days, 40 days. And in my opinion, I, I don't think we, we touch on this enough, right? So, you know, obviously we know, and sorry, I'm going to go off my notes, so this is probably going to screw up my uh, succession or my order, but, um, 
But for 40 days, they're doing this. In 40 days, no one took him up on it, right? Like no one, all the warriors were terrified on the, on the Israelite side. And then David's there, and we all know what happens there. But imagine, so David's brothers who had been there for 40 days had every opportunity to fight him, chose not to, right? King Saul, King Saul, what was his background? He was a warrior, right? Had every opportunity to fight him. Did he fight him? No, of course not. Right? So set, just let that kind of sink in right there. Okay? So then Jesse said to his son David, Now, take for your brothers an ephod of this dried grain and these ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp. Because what was David doing? David was tending sheep. Okay? So his, his, Jesse basically asked him to go be Uber Eats for him and to basically go deliver this food. Right? And it's funny because Jesse, Jesse's basically saying, like, Hey, man, like, I know you might be chosen. Right? But right now, I just need you to Uber Eats this over to your brother. Um, and an insignificant assignment is about to turn into a significant opportunity. So there's no way that Jesse knew what was about to happen was about to con completely transform the life of his kid. Right? Because in verse 18, it says, And carry these ten cheeses to the captains of their ten thousands, and see your brothers, uh, fare, how your brothers fare, and bring back news to, of them. Now, Saul and all of his men of Israel were in the Valley of Elah um, fighting with the Philistines. And that's probably where David probably wished he was like that whole time, right? Like he was out there with the sheep, but he was probably, probably part of him where he said, I want to be on the front line of the battle too, right? Um, but I just want to, again, to reiterate the fact that at this point, David was just a kid who was bringing a cheese lunch to his brothers, you know, the most important person of the story was not at the front lines. He had been with the sheep. So, David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper. And, and wait, really, let me just touch on that real quick. Did he just leave the sheep? No, right? Because did he love the sheep? Did he care for the sheep? Yeah, like yesterday in my quiet time, the, the shepherd, uh, it was a passage of like the good shepherd. And it talks about like how, like the, the shepherd always, like the good shepherd takes care of his sheep. It would have been very easy for him just to leave the sheep because he was really excited, but like, no, he was a man of responsibility, right? So he left, his, he left the sheep with a keeper, never overlooked that responsibility either. And he took the things and he went as Jesse's commanded them. And he, uh, when he came to the camp, as the army was going out to fight and to shout at the battle, for Israel and the Philistines has grown up uh, the battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came to, bre to greet his brothers. Now, the king of Israel is delivering lunch to his brothers, something you would never expect an anointed king to do. You know, he does his act of obedience, and 80% of the time, our attitude is everything. He could have gone out there with a bad attitude, and he probably would not have received this blessing, right? But although it seemed that he was doing something that really didn't matter, really insignificant, and honestly a task that might even be beneath him, it was at that point of his life that his obedience brought him to the perfect blessing. Christina, you got somebody looking for you. <clears throat> you see, because at this point, <laughs> Isaac, don't bother Myrna, you can bother mom. Because <laughs> <clears throat> it's the point where he's dropping off the food that he heard Goliath shouting and mocking the Israelites. And in verse 23, it says that David heard it. Now, because he heard it, he did something about it. And because he did something about it, he saved the entire nation of Israel. So you see, it's like, it's not just enough to hear it, but you have to actually do something with that, right? And our, our faith and the acts of our faith, it's not just faith alone, but it's faith in action together with the works that will actually bring change, right? See, because he never would have done something if he never heard it, right? He never would have heard it if he wasn't at the battle lines with his brother, he never would have been at the battle line with, the, with his brothers if he wasn't taking them food. He wouldn't have been taking them food if he wasn't obedient to his dad, right? Again, all the things that seemed insignificant actually ended up being very, very significant. So let me ask you guys something. What do you think that you have to do this week that's rather ins insignificant? What are the insignificant tasks that we live out day in and day out and we think that there's really... Like, it's really kind of silly. Because I will tell you, the same way with King David here, right? Our faithfulness in the task that seems insignificant can open a door for something huge. But it's only if we are faithful in that. 
Because I do not believe there are things that are insignificant in the eyes of God. Because God uses the insignificant for supernatural moments, right? So as you know, Old Testament is really important in our lives. It's able to go back and to see what the life of the people before us looked like, how God interacted with them. We learn so much from the character of God in the Old Testament and how he deals with these Bible characters, right? We can learn to model our faith the way that they did, to look at someone who looked like, who, uh, who someone like David, who smelled, who seemed to have an in, insignificant job, who was the least of his brothers, whose father didn't even believe in him, right? And that God chose him and anointed him and kept him going back and forth in the ordinary, you know, teaching him obedience, building him in his faith until it was time to do something amazing. 1 Samuel 17, 25. So the, so the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be said that the one who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches. And it shall be that man who kills that the king will, in, uh, that will, he will give him his daughters and his father's house in exemption from the taxes of Israel. And we know this guy. This was a guy on the battleground who he's really good at pointing out the problem. Just pointing out the problem. He was not, he didn't offer solution. He didn't offer his help. He didn't offer anything else. He was just really, really good at pointing out a problem. And I believe that we all have these people in our life, right? We've got people that will point out a bunch of problems. Did he offer any solution? Did he offer any help? No, he was just restating the problem. And I'm gonna tell you that we need to listen to that guy because yeah, if there's a problem, we need to know about it, right? But who does God reward, right? God rewards one who steps out in the faith to be a solution to the problem. And that's what we see in the life of David, right? Because our God is a rewarder. Hebrews 11:6 6, it says, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, right? But something interesting happens next in verse 28. It says, now Eliab, the oldest brother, so we got David's oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, where did you come from? What are you doing here, right? And who did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart that you have come out to see the battle. You know, imagine like, imagine David right now, right? He was just like, are you serious? Like, I just brought you lunch. Like, like I literally, like, I'm, I'm here to serve you. Like, why are you coming at me? Like, why are you so mad, right? And this is a huge life lesson that we all need to wrap our minds around, right? That, you know, it never fails. Whenever you want to do something good, right? Whenever, you know, you're trying to help, someone will always hate on you. And someone will always try to deter you. And in my opinion, when someone is trying to put you down and prevent you from doing something good, it's a good sign that God is trying to lift you up, that he's trying to raise you, right? Because it's at that moment that the devil could be trying to block the good that you're trying to bring, right? So don't be surprised if you're, if you're moving in the right direction, right? That you're, you're moving correctly, that you see transformation just like kind of right around the corner and you start seeing attacks from everywhere because it's the enemy that doesn't want to see you transformed, right? Satan doesn't want to see you transformed. He wants to see you fail. But our God is bigger than him and our God is bigger than our problems. And I love what, what David did here, right? Because he gets attacked by his brother. So he's got noise coming at him from one side, right? And this guy's just saying, you know, he's trying to deter him. And it says in verse 30, he turned from him towards another. That's all he did, right? So he's got a voice. He's got a negative voice coming at him this way, attacking him. And it basically just says he turned from him and turned towards another. And honestly, I think sometimes it's just as simple as that. That's all we need to do is if someone's, got, someone's being negative, just turn your attention towards somebody else. Ignore that person, Right? So he turns to the other guy and he starts asking him questions about Goliath. You see, because he's not going to let someone else's no turn him away from God's yes. And how many times have we missed something? We've missed a blessing, a moment, because we let somebody else's no be the final no. And it deterred us and we didn't walk in faith towards that. So David decides this is his moment. He's not going to let this uncircumcised man talk about the God that he serves that way. 
So they go and they tell Saul, and Saul's response was, is like, you can't go against this Philistine to fight him. You're a youth. He has been a, a man of war since his youth. He says, you're too young, you're too small, you're too ex inexperienced. This is over your head. There's no way you can pull this off, right? And I'll be honest with you, just to throw it in for, for dramatic effect, he probably told them, and you still smell like sheep, right? Like, you, you're not qualified for this, right? And in reality, what Saul is basically saying is, I can't trust you with this either because this isn't you versus him. This is if you lose this, the entire nation of Israel becomes their slave. I can't hand this battle over to you, right? But David had the ability and realized that God in that moment has been preparing all this time with the sheep, right? He was able to realize that, that God was calling him and he knew that he had been transforming already. And he says... Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and I struck it. And I delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard. I struck it and I killed it. And the best way to know that you can be transformed is by remembering what God has already done for you. To see that God has already been at work, right? That he's been with you in the past. Because all of those memories of God's faithfulness all the times we remember that God showed up and God did big things in our life, those aren't just memories, but those are previews of things to come as well. Because the God that was with us in the past, will never, he will never leave us in the future, right? And he goes on and he tells them, your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he's defiled the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. And I love this because it was like, like Saul said, look, if you have that much confidence in God, because David wasn't putting the confidence in himself. He says, if you've got that much confidence in God, go for it. Go ahead. And David did. And he tried to put on some armor. Didn't fit, right? And I love that. I love the fact that he went out without armor because he basically said, like, look, I'm not even going to fake the fact that all of this other stuff even matters, right? A lot of the times we'll rationalize how we're going to do things in our mind because it makes sense to us, right? Like it would make sense to wear armor. But he's just like, I, I, I don't need it. It doesn't fit. Just take it off, right? It says that he grabbed his slingshot and his five stones. And how many did it take to kill him? One. One. He was prepared, but it only took one, right? And the reality of it was that David knew the Lord was fighting with him. And I'm going to tell you, so God fights for all of our transformation. Every single one of us, right? Like he wants to see things. He's got stuff inside of us. He's got purpose. He's got plan. He's got all of this stuff. For, and he is fighting for it, right? And my question is, is, how different would our lives look if we believed that he was fighting for it? That he was for us. That he wanted to see us grow. That he wanted to see us overcome the obstacles and, and the hindrances, right? Would your life look different? Would you make different choices? Would you walk out in faith more often? Would you try bigger things knowing that God was fighting with you the same way that he was fighting with David? And I challenge you guys, like, don't miss the moment. Don't miss the moment. In the coming week, I promise you that there will be moments for you to be faithful, right? And I know that God is trying to work. And I know that God is trying to grow us. And I know that God wants to show up in our lives the same way he showed up in the life of King David. But the question is, is are we going to fight for it? Are we going to fight with him? Are we going to allow him to be victorious? Are you willing to be transformed into what he's called you to? Because he lives for that. But my, my prayer is that for none of us to miss that moment. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of the one God, amen. Dear Lord. We thank you, Lord, because through the life of David, there's so many lessons, Lord. But the, the lessons I want us to take away from today, Lord, is it's not about where we stand today. It's not about our current stature. It's not about our current position. It's not what we do, Lord, but it's about the potential that you've put inside of us. For, Lord, we know that you've called us to great things, Lord. And when it comes to great things, it's great things about your purpose and your call for our life, Lord. It's not about better jobs. It's not about more money. It's not about growing our family. It's not about any of that stuff, Lord. But it's about bringing glory to you. Lord, so I ask that in this coming week, Lord, the same way that you worked with David while he was tending sheep, Lord, in the mundane, in the ordinary, in the stuff that seems insignificant, Lord, 
but you trained him, Lord. You trained him and you grew him, Lord, to prepare him for the big things. I ask that you do the same with us. For, Lord, I know that we have a heart for you. I know we have a heart to serve you. I know that we, wanna, we have a heart that we live out to our full potential. But, Lord, sometimes it's scary. Sometimes it's distracting, Lord. So I ask that you give us the faith of King David, Lord, where we will walk out there with no armor on because we trust you. I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord, that you forgive us, that you strengthen us, Lord, and as you hear these prayers lifted in the session of all your saints from our tears, here so we pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.